Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 7, 1997, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Paul, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the Majority Leader. Mr. Paul. Mr. Speaker, the first session of the 105th Congress has been completed and the third year of the conservative revolution has passed. Current congressional leadership has declared victory and is now debating how to spend the excess revenues about to flow into the Treasury. As the legislative year came to a close, the only serious debate was over the extent of the spending increases negotiated into the budget. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Control over the Congress is not seriously threatened, and there has been no clear-cut rejection of the 20th century welfare state. But that does not mean there is no effort to change the direction of the country. It's just that it's not yet in progress. But many taxpayers throughout the country are demanding change, and today there are more people in Washington expressing a sincere desire to shrink the welfare state than there were when I left 13 years ago. The final word on this has not yet been heard. In contemplating what needs to be done and why we haven't done better, we should consider several philosophic infractions in which members of Congress participate that encourage a loss of liberty and endanger our national security and the Republic while perpetuating the status quo. Following are some of the flaws or errors in thinking about issues that I find pervasive throughout the Congress. Foreign affairs. Although foreign affairs was not on the top of the agenda in the last session, misunderstanding in this area presents one of the greatest threats to the future of America. There is near conformity, uniformity of opinion in the Congress for endorsing the careless use of U.S. force to police the world. Although foreign policy was infrequently debated in the past year and there are no major wars going on or likely to start soon, the danger inherent in foreign entanglements warrants close scrutiny. The economy, crime, the environment, drugs, currency instability, and many other problems are important, but it's in the area of foreign policy and foreign interventionism that provokes the greatest threat to our liberties and sovereignty. Whenever there are foreign monsters to slay, regardless of their true threat to us, misplaced patriotic zeal is used to force us to look outward and away from domestic problems and the infractions placed on our personal liberties here at home. Protecting personal liberties in any society is always more difficult during war. The uniformity of opinion in Congress is enshrined with the common cliches that no one thinks through, like foreign policy is bipartisan. Only the president can formulate foreign policy. We must support the troops, and therefore, of course, the war, which is usually illegal and unwise, but can't be challenged. We are the only world superpower. We must protect our interests like oil. However, it's never admitted, although most know, our policy is designed to promote the military-industrial complex and world government. Most recently, the Congress almost unanimously beat the drums for war, i.e. to kill Hussein. And any consideration of the facts involved elicited charges of anti-patriotism. Yet, in the midst of the clamor to send our planes and bombs to Baghdad, cooler heads were found in, all, in of all places, Kuwait. A Kuwaiti professor amazingly was quoted in a popular pro-government Kuwaiti newspaper as saying, quote, the U.S. frightens us with Saddam to make us buy weapons and sign contracts with American companies, close quote, thus ignoring a market, thus ensuring a market for American arms manufacturers and the United States' continued military presence in the Middle East. A Kuwaiti legislator was quoted as saying, quote, the use of force has ended up strengthening the Iraqi regime rather than weakening it, close quote. Other Kuwaitis have suggested that the U.S. really wants Hussein in power to make sure his weak neighbors fear him and are forced to depend on the United States for survival. In spite of the reservations and reasons to go slow, the only criticism coming from congressional leaders was that Clinton should do more quicker without any serious thought as to the consequences which would be many. The fact that of the original 35 allies in the Persian Gulf War, only one remains, Great Britain, should make us question our policy in this region. This attitude in Washington should concern all Americans. It makes it too easy for a president to start a senseless war without considering dollar costs or threat to liberty here and abroad. Even without a major war, this policy enhances the prestige and the influence of the United Nations.
These days, not even the United States moves without a permission from the UN Security Council. In checking with the U.S. Air Force about the history of U-2 flights in Iraq, over Iraq, and their current schedules, I was firmly told the Air Force was not in charge of these flights. The UN was. The Air Force just suggested I call the Defense Department. There is much to be concerned about with our current approach to foreign policy. It's dangerous because it can lead to a senseless war like Vietnam, or small ones with bad results like in Somalia. Individual freedom is always under attack, and once there is any serious confrontation with a foreign enemy, we are all required to rally around the president no matter how flawed the policy. Too often, the consequences are unforeseen, like making Hussein stronger and not weaker after the Persian Gulf War. The role of the military-industrial complex cannot be ignored, and since the marching orders come from the United Nations, the industrial complex is more international than ever. But there is reason to believe the hidden agenda of our, of our foreign policy is less hidden than it had been in the past. In referring to the United States and the international oil company's success in the Caspian Sea, a Houston newspaper recently proclaimed, quote, U.S. views pipelines as a big foreign policy victory, close quote. This referred to the success of major deals made by giant oil companies to build pipelines to carry oil out of the Caspian Sea, while also delivering a strong message that for these projects to be successful and further enhance U.S. foreign policy, it will require government subsidies to help pay the bill. Market developments of the pipelines would be cheaper, but would not satisfy our international government planners, so we must be prepared to pay, as we already have started to, through our foreign aid appropriations. This promotes, on a grand scale, a government business partnership that is dangerous to those who love liberty and detest fascism. And yet, most members of Congress will say little, ask little, and understand little while joining in the emotional outburst directed toward the local thugs running the Mideastern fiefdoms like Iraq and Libya. This attitude, as pervasive as it is in Washington, is tempered by the people's instincts for minding our own business, not wanting Americans to be the policemen of the world, and deep concern for American sovereignty. The result, not too unusual, is for the politicians in Washington to be doing one thing while saying something else when at home. At home, virtually all citizens condemn U.S. troops serving under U.N. command, and yet the financing and support for expanding the United Nations and NATO's role continues as the hysteria mounts for marching on Baghdad or Bosnia or Haiti or wherever our leaders decide the next monster is to be found. The large majority of House members claim they want our troops out of Bosnia, yet the President gets all the funding he wants. The members of Congress get credit at home for paying lip service to a U.S. policy of less intervention, while a majority continue to support the troops, the President, the military-industrial complex, and the special interests who drive our foreign policy, demanding more funding while risking the lives, property, peace, and liberty of American citizens. Congress casually passes resolution after resolution, many times nearly unanimously, condemning some injustice in the world, and for the most part, there is a true injustice, but along with the caveat that threatens some unconstitutional U.S. military interference, financial assistance or withdrawal of assistance, or sanctions in order to force our will on someone else. And it's all done in the name of promoting the United Nations and one world government. Many resolutions on principle are similar to the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which became equivalent to a declaration of war and allowed for the massive loss of life in the Vietnam fiasco. Most members of Congress fail to see the significance of threatening violence against countries like Libya, Somalia, Rwanda, Bosnia, Iraq, Iran, or Haiti. Yet our credibility suffers since our policies can never satisfy both sides of each regional conflict. In the Middle East, even with all our announced intentions and military effort to protect Kuwait, our credibility is questioned as most Arabs still see us as pro-Israel, anti-Arab, and motivated by power, oil, and money. America's effort to prevent a million casualties in Rwanda doesn't anywhere compare to our perennial effort to get Hussein. It is hardly violations of borders or the possession of weapons of mass destruction that motivates us to get Hussein or drive our foreign policy.
We were allies of Iraq when it used poison gas against the Kurds and crossed the border into Iran. We support the Turks even though they murder Kurds, but we condemn the Iraqis when they do the same thing. There are more than 25,000 Soviet nuclear warheads that cannot be accounted for, and all we hear about from the politicians is about Iraq's control of weapons of mass destruction. Our policy in the Middle East is totally schizophrenic and driven by Arab oil, weapon sales, and Israel. This is especially dangerous because the history of the West's intrusion into the Middle East for a thousand years in establishing the artificial borders that exist today has created a mindset among Islamic fundamentalists that guarantees that friction will persist in this region no matter how many Husseins or Ayatollahs we kill. That would only make things worse for us. As much as I fear and detest one world government, this chaos that we contribute to in the Middle East assures me that there is no smooth sailing for the New World Order. Rough seas are ahead for all of us. If the UN's plan for their type of order is successful, it will cost American citizens money and freedom. If significant violence breaks out, it will cost American citizens money, freedom, and lives. Yes, I fear a biological and even a nuclear accident, but I see our cities as a much, at a much greater risk because of our policy than if we were neutral and friends with all factions. Instead of trying to be a financial and military ally of all factions depending on the circumstances. The way we usually get dragged into a shooting war is by some unpredictable incident where innocent Americans are killed after our government placed them in harm's way and the enemy provoked. Then the argument is made that once hostilities break out, debating the policy that created the mess is off limits. Everybody then must agree to support the troops. But the best way to support our troops and our liberties is to have a policy that avoids unnecessary confrontation. A pro-American constitutional policy of non-intervention would go a long way toward guaranteeing maximum liberty and protection of life and property for all Americans. American interests around the world could best be served by friendship and trade with all who would be friends and subsidies to none. The balanced budget. There's a naive assumption in Washington that the budget is under control and will soon be balanced while believing perpetual prosperity is here and new programs can now be seriously considered. It reminds me of an old Chinese saying, when words lose their meaning, people lose their liberty. Even the revolutionaries have, cla have claimed victory. One of the staunchest members recently declared, in the end, we achieved a balanced budget for the first time since 1969. Medicare and welfare were reformed all in three short years, a truly remarkable record on how far we've come. I can understand a positive spin on events of the last three years by party leaders. That's what party leaders do. But the revolutionary members of the 104th Congress should not be taken in easily or quickly. But Washington has a strange way of dulling the senses, and no one enjoys peer rejection or lonely fights where one is depicted as pursuing a fruitless adventure and appearing negative. Capitulating to the status quo is the road of least resistance, and rationalizations are generously offered up. It has been especially tempting for members of Congress to accept the projection of higher revenues at a panacea, as a panacea to our budgetary problems. The prevailing attitude in Washington as 1997 came to a close was that the limited government forces had succeeded. The conservative revolution was won, and now it's time to move on and make government work more efficiently. I'm sure some know better, but the real reason for these declarations of budgetary success is for the sole purpose of maintaining power. Minority leaders find themselves frustrated because they, they know spending has gone up and the higher tax revenues have helped those in charge. The Republican Congress and the President Clinton benefited while the Democratic congressional leaders could only ask, why can't, we be, why can't more be spent on welfare if the country is doing so well? Fundamental problems like the size of the budget, the deficit, the debt, higher taxes, currency problems, and excessive regulations were put on the back burner if not ignored altogether. While complacency regarding foreign policy sets the stage for danger overseas, this naive attitude regarding the budget and the deficit is permitting the welfare state to be re-energized and cancel entirely any efforts to reduce the size and scope of government. Under Reagan, 
as in the early, as in the early parts of the Republican control of Congress, some signs of deceleration in the growth of government were seen. But even then, there was no pretense made to shrink the size of government. And once again, the path of least resistance has been to capitulate and allow government to grow as it has been for decades. Heaven forbid no one ever again wants to be blamed for closing down non-essential government services. Only cruel and heartless constitutionalists would ever suggest such a politically foolish stunt. And it's not going to happen. 1997 has proven that many that what many have suspected, that reversing or arresting a welfare state cannot occur by a majority vote. With apparent wealth abundance in the United States, the reversal assuredly will not come with ease. Once redistribution of wealth is permitted by the Democratic vote, destruction of production will occur before the majority will choose to curtail their own benefits. The end is closer than most realize, considering the optimistic rhetoric coming from Washington, plus the fact the majority of citizens are beneficiary of the system, and even the producers have grown dependent on government protection, grants, contracts, and special subsidies. Although the session ended on a modestly happy bipartisan note, I suspect in time 1997 will be looked upon as a sad year in that the limited government revolution of 1994 was declared lost by adjournment time in, in November. That does not mean the fight for liberty is over. But the hope that came by reversing congressional rule after 40 years has been dampened, and a lot more work is necessary for success. The real battle is to win the hearts and minds of Americans outside of Washington to prepare the country for the day when the welfare state ceases to function due to an empty treasury and the dollar, not worth its weight, comes under attack. Specific wor uh, specifics worth pondering. The budget for current fiscal year, 1998, calls for expenditures of $1.69 trillion or $89 billion above last year. The 1997 budget was $22 billion over 96. The so-called balanced budget bragged about is to occur in the year 2002, with more cuts being made in the year 2001 and at a level of spending far above today's. The expenditures in the year 2002 are expected to increase to $1.9 trillion, over $200 billion more than this year. Increased revenues obviously accomplish the job of a theoretically balanced budget. But also, these projections do not take into account the huge sums borrowed from Social Security. Even if things go well and as planned, the optimism is based on deception, wishful thinking, and a huge rage on the Social Security and other trust funds. In spite of this, the politicians in Washington are eagerly planning on how to spend the coming budgetary surpluses. All these rosy projections are dependent on economic strength, steady low interest rates, and no supplemental appropriations. Every session of Congress gets supplementals, and if the economy takes a downturn, the higher the appropriation. The last three years aren't much to brag about. Domestic spending has gone up by $183 billion. In the prior three years, when Democrats controlled the Congress, spending increased by $155 billion. Tax increases are now inevitably referred to as revenue enhancement and closing of loopholes. In spite of some wonderful IRS bashing by nearly everyone and positive hearings and exposing the ruthless tactics of the IRS, Congress and the President saw fit to give the IRS a whopping $729 million increase in its budget, hoping the IRS will become more efficient in their collection process. Real spending cuts are not seriously considered. Congress continues to obfuscate by calling token cuts in previously proposed increases as budget cuts. And the media and the proponents of big government welfare obediently demagogue this issue by decrying why the slashes in the budget are inhumane and uncaring. Without honesty in language and budgeting, true reforms are impossible. In spite of the rhetoric, bold new educational and medical programs were started, setting the stage for massive new spending in the future. New programs always cost more than originally projected. The block grant approach to reform did not prompt a decrease in spending and frequently added to it. The principle of whether or not the federal government should even be involved in education, medicine, welfare, farming, etc., was not seriously considered. The 1998 budget is the largest ever and represents the biggest increase in the domestic budget in eight years. Those in charge threw in the towel and surrendered all efforts this past year to cut back the size of government. 
And in this fiscal year, many can see the deficit will actually go up, even without a slowing in the economy. In this, in this year's budget, Medicare and Medicaid increased four to five times the rate of inflation. This is not a complete surprise to the logical skeptics when it comes to fiscal matters, but it is just a little exasperating to hear the positive pronouncements of current leaders who just a few years ago would have been only too eager to point out the shortcomings of deceptive arithmetic. Power is a corrupting influence, but for now at least, a congressional power shift is not in the making. There are still a lot of recipients that are happily reassured that additional revenues can be found. The new management is welcomed, and it's hoped the new guys on the block can salvage for a while a system that many, deep down in their hearts, are convinced is not manageable for much longer. There is a sense of relief. The welfare state has received a reprieve. One can almost hear the sigh amplified by hearing of the problems in the Southeast Asia uh, countries with their currency and stock market problems, not realizing it's the U.S. taxpayers and the dollar that will be called upon for the bailout of this financial crisis. The great danger of all this is the false sense of economic security Congress feels that has prompted total abandonment of efforts to actually cut any spending and with plans being laid for spending increases. The message is this, the politicians will never limit spending, but eventually the market will. It has already done so in Thailand, South Korea, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia. The international currency crisis. Congress lacks concern and understanding of the significance of the Asian currency crisis. Monetary policy has never excited many members of the Banking Committee, let alone other members of Congress. A handful of members do consistently complain to the Chairman of the Federal Reserve, but inevitably it's to object to the high interest rates and not enough credit being available to either the poor or the rich beneficiaries of central bank credit largesse. The Southeast Asian currency and economic bailout will exceed $100 billion. We will be propping up these currencies by sending American taxpayers dollars, the same thing we did in Mexico in 1995. Multilateral efforts through the IMF, the World Bank, and other development banks are used, and in each one, the United States is the most generous donor. IMF bailouts, just as our military foreign intervention, are generally supported by the leadership of both parties. The establishment has firm control in these two areas and who, out of ignorance or neglect, the Congress as a whole provides little resistance. When the stronger currencies, and in this case the dollar, props up a weaker currency, it is nothing more than an example of an international transfer payment that helps our banks and international corporate investors who have financial exposure in the country or the currency under attack. These bailouts will work to some degree until the dollar itself comes under attack. Our relatively strong economy and the current perceptions of undue dollar strength allows great leverage in this extremely expensive and risky bailout operation. The genius of it all is that Federal Reserve credit expansion and its off-budget budgeting permits these funds to be spent without oversight. IMF appropriations are not even counted toward the deficit, and credit expansion is under complete control of the Federal Reserve. Long term, the average American citizen suffers through higher interest rates, rising prices, recessions, and a lower standard of living, but the cause and effect is conveniently hidden from the public and the Congress. After the Mexican bailout, her citizens lost 50% of their purchasing power, a dramatic pay cut. Yet the great danger is that someday we will be forced to pay, possibly with a dollar crisis, that will make the Asian currency crisis look small in comparison. All currency crises are serious and usher in economic and political problems for the country involved, and since no one likes it, blame is generally misplaced. When the dollar comes under attack, since it's the reserve currency of the world, a much more serious crisis than we are currently witnessing in Asia will occur. Only a universal acceptance of a single worldwide commodity standard of money can prevent these periodic devaluations and disruptions in trade that are so prevalent today. The day before we adjourned the first session of the 105th Congress, the Banking Committee held hearings on the Asian currency crisis, but it was more of an attempt to reassure the financial community than to sort out the cause and to do something about it. Instead, the dollar was crowned king and Greenspan promised stability. Our real 
interest rates, balance of payments, our current account, account deficit, and budgetary deficits were conveniently ignored because if they had been looked at seriously, it would have been recognized that the U.S. and the world faces a major financial crisis once the dollar can no longer be used to bail out the world financial system. Currency issues are serious and a much bigger problem than Congress realizes. Even the Fed has convinced itself that it is quite capable of managing our fiat currency and our financial markets through any crisis. The money managers are every bit as powerful as the Congress, which taxes and spend, but the Federal Reserve's actions are much less scrutinized. But when push comes to shove, the markets always win out. Interest rates are less than 1% in Japan, have not prompted borrowers to come forth nor bankers to lend. The Bank of Japan won't solve the problem either. Even central bankers can't push on a string. The sad part is that all these shenanigans will cause undue suffering to the innocent who lose their jobs, suffer from price inflation, and see their standard of living shrink. Eventually, Everyone, though, is threatened by the political disruption that can ensue with a currency mishap. Our greatest concern should be for our loss of liberties that so often accompany currency crises. Congressional attitude toward monetary policy is not likely to change soon, so we can expect a lot more turmoil in the currency markets in the months ahead. Two special areas. Congress in the past year capitulated in the two significant areas but not, by not only failing to cut spending but massively increasing government's role in medicine and in education. House Republicans bragged that seven out of eight educational initiatives passed the House, many of them being quite expensive. Charter schools cost over $100 million. Funding for vouchers was increased. Three, $3 billion was appropriated to extend student loans and a new $210 million reading and excellence program was initiated. A program for high-tech training and one designed to help children with disabilities was also started. Clinton's new health care program for children was accepted by Congress, which will eventually cost billions and further centralized medical care in Washington, while quality of care is diminished. Billions of dollars increased in NIH, AIDS research, and preventative health care were also approved. The federal government has been involved in education and medicine more than in any other domestic area. This has caused the serious price inflection for these two services while undermining the quality and results in both. The more we spend, the higher the cost, the worse the service, and the greater the regulations. So what did Congress do to solve the problems in the past year? Even in this so-called age of cutting back and balanced budget, it expanded government precisely in the two areas that suffer the most from big government. This is strong evidence that we have not yet learned anything in the past 50 years, and the 1994 revolution hasn't yet changed things. We can expect more HMOs and PPO mismanagement, rationing medical service, and price control of all medical services. Shortages of quality health care and education will result. Devolution. Block grants are the popular vehicle to restore local control of the federal bureaucracy. The housing bill, the first major chain to public housing since the Depression, did not cut spending but actually increased funding through the block grant system of devolving power to the states. A token effort similar to this was made in the early 1970s under Nixon called revenue sharing. It didn't work and was dropped. This new method won't work either. Whether the bureaucrats are in Washington or in the state capitals, it won't change the dynamics of public housing. Public ownership, whether managed locally or federally, cannot replace the benefits of private ownership. Besides, the block grant method of allocating funds does not eliminate the need to first collect the revenues nationally and politically distribute the funds to the various state entities. Strings will always be attached, no matter how many safeguards are written into the law. The process of devolution is an adjustment in management and doesn't deal with the philosophic question of whether or not the federal government or even the state governments ought to be involved. The high hopes that this process will alter the course of the welfare state will, I'm sure, be dashed after many more years of failures and dollars spent. There is essentially no serious consideration in Washington for abolishing agencies, let alone whole departments. If the funding for the pornographic NEA can't be cut, which agency of government should we expect to be? The devolution approach is not the proponents of big government's first choice, but it is acceptable to them. Early adjournment meant the call for more spending was satisfied and the supporters of big government, in spite of the rhetoric, were content. 
Searching for a partisan issue, the minority was content with campaign reform and the questions surrounding illegal voting. Devolution is said to be a return to states' rights, since it's inferred that management of the program will be decentralized. This is a new 1990s definition of the original concept of states' rights and will prove not to be an adequate substitute. At the same time, these token efforts were made in welfare, education, and human resources reform. Congress gave the federal government massive new influence over adoption and juvenile crime, education, and medicine. Block grants to states for specific purposes after collecting the revenues at the federal level is foreign to the concept that once was understood as states' rights. This process, even if temporarily beneficial, will do nothing to challenge the underlying principle and shortcomings of the welfare state. Real battles. The real battles in the Congress are more often over power and personalities than philosophy. Both sides of most debates represent only a variation of some interventionist program. Moral and constitutional challenges are made when convenient and rights uh, and never follow a consistent pattern. These, along with the state rights arguments, are not infrequently just excuses used to justify opposing or, or approving a program supported for some entirely different reason. The person who makes any effort at consistency is said to be extreme or unyielding. After giving a short speech criticizing the inconsistency of our foreign policy, another member quickly rose to his feet and used a Ralph Walter Emerson quote to criticize my effort, saying, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines. Criticizing another member for following a consistent freedom philosophy and strict adherence to the Constitution is more of an attempt to reassure the critics themselves who are uneasy with their own position. Obviously, criticizing one for consistency either means that pragmatism and inconsistency is something to be proud of, or there is little respect for the philosophy that is consistently being defended, a truth the critics are not likely to admit. Public relation debates. Oftentimes, the big debates in Congress are more public relation efforts than debates on real issues. This is certainly true when it comes to preventing foreign aid funds from being used by any organization for abortions. I agree with and vote for all attempts to curtail the use of U.S. taxpayers for adoption, for abortion within or outside the United States. But many in the pro-life movement aren't interested in just denying all birth control, population control, and abortion money to everyone and avoid the very controversial effort to impose our will on other nations. Believing money allocated to any organization or country is not fungible is naive to say the least. The biggest problem is that many who are sincerely right to life and believe the Mexico City language restriction on foreign aid will work are also philosophic believers in internationalism, both social and military. The politics of it has allowed temporary withholding of IMF and UN funds in order to pressure the president into accepting the restrictive abortion language. Withholding these funds from the United Nations and the IMF in this case has nothing to do with the criticism of the philosophy behind the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank, and why the international government agencies are tax burdens on the American people. It's conceded by the majority on both sides of this debate that the UN, the IMF, the development banks, and even the funds for population control are legitimate expenditures and eventually will be funded. The question is only whether or not a public relations victory can be achieved by the radical pro-abortion supporters of the president's or the pro-life supporters. We have at least started to debate the merits of any money at all going for population control, the United Nations or the IMF. This is where the debate should be. Even though the restrictions that the Mexico City language might place on foreign expenditures probably won't change the number of abortions around the world, the vote itself does reflect through Congress the sentiment of the American people and therefore its importance cannot be denied. But I am convinced that if the American people had the option of whether or not to send any money at all, they would reject all the funding making the restriction debate moot. Most would agree with the fungibility argument, even when funds are sent for reasons other than family planning and abortion, like military assistance. The amazing thing is how important the debate can appear by threatening to withhold greatly sought after IMF funds for an argument that doesn't get to the heart of the issue. What should be debated is whether or not Congress has the moral and constitutional authority to use force to take funds from American citizens for social engineering around the world, much of which results in resentment toward America.
The weak and ineffective conditions placed on foreign aid money to prevent abortions is hardly a legitimate reason for continuing the, illegi the illegal funding in the first place. At times, efforts to get more swing votes to endorse Mexico City language, some pro-life forces not only won't challenge the principle of our funding for birth control and population control overseas, but believe in increasing the appropriation for the program. If the constitutionists cannot change the nature of the debate, we will never win these arguments. Corporatism. Congress and the administration is greatly influenced by corporate America. We truly have a system of corporatism that, if not checked, will evolve into a much more threatening form of fascism. Our welfare system provides benefits for the welfare poor, and in return, the recipients vote to perpetuate the entire system. Both parties are quite willing to continue the status quo and not questioning the authority upon which these programs are justified. But the general public is unaware of how powerful corporate America is in changing and influencing legislation. Even those programs said to be specific for the poor, like food stamps, housing, education, and medicine, have corporate beneficiaries. These benefits to corporate America are magnified when it's realized that many of the welfare redistributionist programs are so often not successful in helping the poor. But there are many other programs precisely designed to satisfy the special interests of big business. A casual observer might think the political party that champions the needs of the poor would not be getting political and financial support from the rich. But quite clearly, both parties are very willing to receive financial and political support from special interests representing the rich and the poor, business and labor, domestic and foreign. We should not expect campaign reform or reliable revelations of campaign fundraising abuse in today's political climate. There are strong bipartisan reasons to keep the debate on only a superficial level. All the rules in the world will never eliminate the motivation of the, uh, or the ability of the powerful special interest to influence Congress. Loopholes and illegal contributions will plague us for as long as Congress continues with the power to regulate, tax, or detax, subsidize, or punish essentially everyone participating in the economy. The most we can ever hope for is to demand full disclosure. Then, if influence is bought, at least it would be in the open. The other most difficult task, and the only thing that will ever dampen special interest control of government, would be to radically reduce the power of Congress over our lives and our economy. Taxpayer funding of campaigns would prove disastrous. The special areas of the budget that are of specific benefit to corporate America are literally too numerous to count. But there are some special programs benefiting corporations that usually prompt unconditional support from both parties. The military-industrial complex is correctly recognized for its influence in Washington. This same group has, vested, has a vested interest in our foreign policy that encourages policing the world, nation-building, and foreign social engineering. Big contracts are given to friendly corporations in places like Haiti, Bosnia, and the Persian Gulf, War, Persian Gulf region. Corporations benefiting from these programs are unable to deal objectively with foreign policy issues. And it's not unusual for these same corporate leaders to lobby for troop deployments and worldwide military intervention. The U.S. remains the world top's arms manufacturer, and our foreign policy permits the exports to world customers subsidized through the Export-Import Bank. Foreign aid, Overseas Private Investment Corporation, Export Import Bank, IMF, World Bank, Development Banks are all used to continue bailouts of third world countries heavily invested in by our corporations and banks. Corporations can get special tax treatment that only the powerful and influential can achieve. For instance, pseudo-free trade legislation like NAFTA and GATT and the recent Fast Track legislation shows how much big business influences both congressional leaders and the administration. While crumbs are cast to the poor with programs that promote permanent dependency and impoverishment, the big bucks go to the corporations and the banking elites. The poor welcome the crumbs, not realizing how much long-term harm the programs do as they obediently continue to vote for a corporate-biased welfare state where the rich get richer and the poor get forgotten. Since generally both parties support a different version of interventionism, one should not expect the programs for the rich to be attacked on principle or cut in size. The result of last year's legislative session should surprise no one.
Both types of welfare expenditures benefit from a monetary system that creates credit out of thin air in order to monetize congressional deficits when needed and manipulate interest rates downward to non-market levels to serve the interests of big borrowers and lenders. Federal Reserve policy is an essential element in serving the powerful special interests. Monetary mischief of this type will not likely be ended by congressional action, but will be eventually stopped by market forces, just as has recently occurred in the Middle, in the Far East. Voluntary contracts. There is a, there is little understanding or desire in Congress to consistently protect voluntary contracts. Many of our programs to improve race relations have come from government interference in the voluntary economic contract. Government's role in a free society should be to enforce contracts, yet too often it does the opposite. All labor laws, affirmative action programs, and consumer protection laws are based on the unconstitutional authority of government to regulate voluntary economic contracts. If the same process were applied to the press, it would be correctly condemned as prior restraint and ruled unconstitutional. Throughout the 20th century, economic and personal liberties have undergone a systematic separation. Rules applying to the media and personal relationships are no longer applied to, uh, no longer apply to voluntary economic transactions. Some members of Congress are quite vocal in defending the First Amendment and fight hard to protect freedom of expression by cautioning against any effort at prior restraint. They can speak eloquently on why V-chip technology in the hands of the government may lead to bad things, even if proponents are motivated to protect our children from pornography. Likewise, these partial civil libertarians are quite capable of demanding the protection of all adult voluntary sexual activity. They mount respectable challenges to the social authoritarian who never hesitates to use government force to mold society and prove personal moral behavior. But these same champions of personal liberty do not hesitate at all to use the same government force they readily condemn in social matters to impose their vision of a fair and equitable economic system on all of us. Thousands of laws and regulations are on the book to guarantee equality in hiring, pay, and numerous other conditions of employment and for, the th and for theoretical uh, consumer protection. Ironically, the enemies of the voluntary contract when dealing with the media and personal associations are the best defenders of economic liberty and the voluntary economic contract. Unless this glaring inconsistency is reconciled, the republic cannot be salvaged. Too often, the two sides compromise in the wrong direction. Economic libertarians concede too much to the welfare proponents, and the social libertarians concede too much to the authoritarians who eagerly try to legislate good behavior. This willingness to compromise while at the same time criticizing those who have firm beliefs and being overly rigid serve as a serious threat to the cause of liberty. A consistent defense of all voluntary associations does not preclude laws against violence, fraud, theft, libel, and slander. To punish acts of aggression and protect nonviolent economic and social associations is the main purpose of government in a constitutional republic. Moral imperfections cannot be eliminated by government force any more than economic inequalities can be eliminated through welfare or socialist legislation. Once government loses sight of its true purpose of protecting liberty and embarks on a course where the generous use of force is used to interfere in the voluntary social and economic contracts, liberty will be diminished and the foundation of a true republic undermined. That is where we are today. The effort of both sides to do good threatens personal liberty. There is no evidence that laws designed to improve personal sexual habits, the quality of the press, or the plight of the poor have helped. The poor, under all programs of forced redistribution of wealth, always become more numerous, and the state inevitably abuses its power when it tries to regulate freedom of expression or improve personal behavior. Too often, both sides allow the principle of government force to be used to interfere in the internal affairs of other nations at a great cost and risk to American taxpayers while accomplishing little to promote a firm hatred of America for the interference. This itself is a threat to our security. The resulting conditions of international conflict are often used as the excuse to further curtail the civil liberties of all Americans. In recent years, freedom of the press has been severely challenged when we are actively involved in military operations. Our young people are threatened as they are needlessly exposed to enemy fire and medical experimentation, and there is always an economic cost through higher taxes. National sovereignty designed to protect liberty in a republic is challenged as our foreign operations are controlled by UN resolutions, not Congress.
Under these conditions, our cities are more likely to be targeted by terrorists for the hatred of our policies, our policies fuel. Draft registration remains in place just in case more bodies are needed for our standing UN armies. The draft remains the ultimate attack on volunteerism and represents the most direct affront to individual liberty. This is, made, this is made that much worse when one realizes that it's highly unlikely that we'll ever see American troops in action under anything other than a UN-sponsored war or military operation. Only with a greater understanding and respect for individual liberty and the importance of voluntary associations in all areas of social and economic life will we be able to preserve our liberty and peace and prosperity. This is required for the Republic to survive. As long as it is fashionable or humorous to refer to one who consistently defends individual liberty as a hobgoblin of little minds, our liberties will be threatened. Accepting and rationalizing any inconsistency while rejecting the principal defenders of a free society as impractical represents a danger to the Republic. A strict adherence to the Constitution is surely not something that should be encouraged or tolerated, according to these critics. By insisting that all government action be guided by tolerance and compromise in any effort to protect liberty, it is only natural that strict observance to standards in other areas would be abandoned. And it's true, we now live in an age where life has relative value, money has no definition, marriage is undefinable, moral values are taught as relative ethics in our classrooms, good grades in the classroom no longer reflect excellence, success in business is often subject to doubts because of affirmative action, and corporate profits depend more on good lobbyists and influence in Washington than creative effort. Pragmatism and interventionism are popular because of their convenience and appeal to those who crave governing over others and those who expect unearned benefits. This process can last a long time when some incentives to produce remain in place. But eventually, it leads to an attack on the value of money, confiscatory taxation, over-regulation, excessive borrowing on the future, and undermining of trust in the political process. Once this system is entrenched, it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to gracefully reverse the process. The usual result is the, very, is the various groups receiving benefits become highly competitive and bitter toward each other. Eventually, it leads to a time when compromise and government planning no longer look practical or fair. In the next few years, we can expect this to become more evident as Congress will be forced to acknowledge that the budget has more problems than was admitted to in the closing days of the first session of the 105th Congress. If we do not define the type of government we are striving for and reject interventionism as a doctrine, the endless debate will remain buried in details of form and degree of the current system with no discussion of substance. Merely deciding where to draw the line on government involvement in our lives will consume all the energy of the legislative process. Whether or not we should be involved at all will receive little attention. In order to direct our efforts toward preservation of liberty in lieu of planning the economy and regulating people, we must have a clear understanding of rights. But could British Prime Minister Tony Blair be telling us something about Western civilization and government's responsibility to the people. Blair was quoted in a recent visit with the President saying, I tell you, a decent society is not based on rights. It's based on duty, our duty to one another. To all should be given opportunity from all responsibility demanded, close quote. This sounds just a tad authoritarian and closer to the Communist Manifesto than to the Magna Carta or the Bill of Rights. A free society is just the opposite. I argue that a free society is the only decent society and the only one that I care to live in. A free society depends entirely on personal rights for which all individuals are naturally entitled. This was the bedrock of the Declaration of Independence in our Constitution and the principle upon which our Republic rests. Yet today, most of the West, now engulfed by Keynesian welfareism, sadly accepts the Blair philosophy. Duty and responsibility, as Blair sees it, is not the voluntary responsibility found in a free society, but rather duty and responsibility to the state. He's right about one thing. If duty to the state is accepted as an uncontested fact, rights are meaningless. And every day our rights are indeed becoming more threatened. 
We have come to accept it as immoral and selfish to demand individual rights. Today, rights are too frequently accepted as being collective, such as minority, gay, women, handicapped, poor, or student rights. But rights are only individual. Everyone has a right to life, liberty, and property, and it comes naturally or is a God-given gift. And the purpose of the state is to protect equally everyone's rights. The whole purpose of political action should be to protect liberty. Free individuals then, with a sense of responsibility and compassion, must then strive for moral excellence and economic betterment. When government loses sight of the importance of rights and assumes the responsibility reserved to free individuals and sets about to make the economy equally fair to everyone and improve personal nonviolent behavior, the effort can only be made at the expense of liberty with the effort ending in failure. National governments should exist to protect individual liberty at home by enforcing laws against violence and fraud and from outside threats. The bigger and more international government becomes, the more likely it is that the effort will fail. The original challenge to the champions of freedom centuries ago was always to limit the powers of the king. Today, the challenge, every bit as great but harder to define, is to limit the power of democratic parliaments and congresses. Democratic elections of leaders is one thing, but obsession with determining all rights by majority vote has now become liberty's greatest enemy. Throughout this century and as the movement grows for one world government, the linchpin is always democracy, not liberty or a constitutionally restrained republic as our founders preferred. As long as the democratic vote can modify rights, the politicians will be on the receiving ends of bribes and money and will be the greatest influence on legislation. When government's sole purpose is to protect the lowliest of the minority, the individual, there will be no market for influence buying. Regulating the peddlers of graft will only make things worse, for the rules will further undermine the right of the individual to petition and seek his own redress of grievances. Detailed rules on political donations and lobbyist activities can easily be circumvented by the avaricious. Only a better understanding of rights and the proper role of government will alter the course upon which we have embarked. Political leaders no longer see their responsibility to protect life and liberty as a sacred trust, and the concept of individual rights has been significantly undermined throughout the 20th century. The record verifies this. Authoritarian governments in this, the bloodiest of all centuries, have annihilated over 100 million people their own. Wars have killed an additional 34 million, and only a small number of these were truly in the defense of liberty. The main motivation behind these mass murders was to maintain political power. Liberty, in many ways, has become the forgotten cause of the 20th century. Even the mildest-mannered welfare depends on government guns and threats of prison to forcibly extract wealth from producers to transfer it to the politically connected. These same government forces, forces, this, this same government force is used by the powerful rich to promote from the programs the design to benefit them. The budgetary process and the transfer of wealth that occurs through monetary inflation is influenced more by the business banking and elite than by the poor. The $1.7 trillion budget is not an investment in liberty. The kings are gone, and I doubt we'll ever see another Stalin, Hitler, Pol Pot, or Mayo, but the majority in our legislative bodies now reign supreme with one goal in mind, maintaining power. To do this, they must satisfy the power brokers pretending they are humanitarian saviors while ignoring their responsibilities to protect liberty. Democracy is now the goal of all those who profess progress and peace, but instead they promote corporatism, inflationism, and world government. The question is, where will our alternative come from? Which group or individual truly speaks for liberty and limited government? The speeches, the rhetoric, the campaigns rarely reveal the underlying support most politicians have for expanding the state, especially when coming from those who are thought to be promoted, promoting limited government. Those who believe in welfare and socialism are frequently more straightforward, but we are now hearing from some traditional opponents of big government admonishing us to stop trashing the government and instead we should be busy fixing it. They do it without once challenging the moral principle that justifies all government intervention in our personal lives and economic transactions.
William Bennett strongly condemns critics of big government, saying, some of today's anti-government rhetoric is contemptuous of history and not intellectually serious. If you listen to it, you come away with the impression that government has never done anything well. In fact, government has done very, some very difficult things quite well, like reduce the number of elderly in poverty, pass civil rights legislation, ensure bank departments and deposits, and ensure that air and water remains clear, clean, close quote. Bennett's great concern is this, disdain of representative government government, democracy, however, makes it virtually impossible to instill in citizens a noble love of country, the state rather than liberty. Bennett complains that Americans no longer love their country because of their utter contempt some have directed against government itself. In other words, we must love our government ruled by the tyrannical majority at all costs or it's impossible to love freedom and America. Any effort to limit the size of government while never challenge the moral principle upon which all government force depends, while blindly defending majoritarian rule for making government work will not restore the American public, republic. Instead, this approach gives credibility to the authoritarians and undermines the limited government movement by ignoring the basic principles of liberty. Only a restoration of a full understanding of individual rights and the purpose of a constitutional republic can reverse this trend. Our republic is indeed threatened. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The chair lays uh, before the House a message from the President. To the Congress of the United States, I hereby report to the Congress on the developments concerning the national emergency with respect to terrorists which threatened to disrupt the Middle East peace process that was declared in Executive Order 12947 of January 23, 1995. Signed, William J. Clinton, the White House, January 27, 1998. The message is uh, referred to the Committee on International Relations and ordered printed.